Hey everybody, this is Nolan from ForwardPlayerNetwork.com, and these are my top 10 games of 2016. Alright, starting things off with Inside. I was a pretty big fan of Limbo. I really enjoyed the game when it came out oh, a very long time ago. Uh, so when I heard that Playdead was making another game, I was really excited. Then we saw that trailer, that first teaser they put out, and there's just a boy kind of running to the right, and I was, I was a little skeptical. Uh, but as soon as I picked up the game, I knew it was going to be special. They just captured a really good tone with the game. You know, there was this boy who was on the run, he didn't really know why, it was kind of confusing, and I was able to relate to that. The game doesn't exactly tell you anything, you kind of solve things out on your own intuitively, and you figure out these small puzzles, and that just felt like I was in that situation. One thing I hate in games is being chased, and this game, oh, they, they chase you. And they got the timing down perfectly to where you, you can usually escape right at, you know, if you just if you just run, you'll get away. But it still feels that that kind of gets up in you because they're chasing me. Uh, and then, you know, they you know, you get that narrow escape, but then later on sometimes, oh, you know, you weren't supposed to run even though you thought you were, and you you know, play dead likes to kill little kids. That's what they do in their games. Uh, but I was always on the edge of my seat when those scenes were going on. Especially the section underwater, because then that ties into the fear of drowning and being chased. But then you get that one item, without spoiling anything, if you play the game, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that does tie into some puzzles as well. And the puzzles in this game weren't the most challenging, but I think they made a good use of uh, 2.5D. There was a lot of times when you were interacting with things in the background. That didn't really add anything to the difficulty of the puzzle, but it helped kind of draw you into the world. The last half hour of the game takes kind of a turn that kind of, it, it just really blew me away. Like, I didn't see that coming, uh, and I couldn't I couldn't put the controller down. Like, I just, it had me hooked. And then you get to the last, like, 10, 15 minutes of this game, and that, oh, I wish I could just say how I, oh, like, mm, that feeling when, when it happens, and you're like, you know, my jaw was on the floor. I was confused but excited, and I just, like, oh, like, I, I couldn't stop playing. And then the game ends, and it's kind of tranquil, and soothing, and I liked it. XCOM Enemy Unknown and Enemy Within the Expansion was a great game. I loved it, but for some reason, like, I just, I didn't get into it the way I got into XCOM 2. And there's a lot of things that contributed to that, like, the countries in Enemy Unknown, you know, they would leave, and then you'd get less funding, and then that could be a fail factor of the game, and that was kind of a frustrating point. And since that wasn't in 2, I think I was able to kind of roll with the punches a little better. And even if I lost a mission, I didn't feel like that was the end of the world. Base building was also something I had difficulty with in the first game that I think they made some pretty good improvements on in the second game. First of all, like, lore-wise, the, the Avenger made sense to me, you know, everyone was on the run from aliens who had taken over, so having this movable base made sense. And then I like that you could you know, cram either, you know, engineers or scientists into a room uh, to decrease the time it took to research a project. That just added a level of complexity that I really liked. I also liked the way they changed up skills and classes in XCOM 2. I really felt that, like, no matter what skill I chose when I leveled up, it was the right choice. Even if even if I wanted both skills, you know, you only you have to choose between two, and both of them are great, I always felt that no matter what I chose, I could make a character work with that. Stealth was a really big deal in this game. Uh, you know, you would have a ranger who would, you know, be stealth, and they could be stealth the entire mission, kind of acting like a spy, gathering information, while your other soldiers would be on the offensive. And granted, uh, the ranger could get caught, but if you gave them, like, the bladestorm ability, oh man, they would make quick work of that enemy, just a nice little slash, and then they're off. 
And that being said, uh, I I really loved every class in this game. Uh, you know, the specialist, you know, they had their gremlin and they could hack robotic enemies and stuff like that. Uh, using the grenadier to shred off armor or use the the hollow targeting. Oh, the hollow targeting was a godsend. Uh, every miss shot was so painful, but with hollow targeting, you could almost hit all of the time. And then obviously sharpshooters, you know, death from above and the kill zone ability you know, just unstoppable. I didn't really get a chance to use the Psy Operatives class, and that's kind of because I didn't get that till very late in the game, which kind of ties into one of my issues in that I felt the game was a little too short. I wish there had been a little more, not just mainly main story missions, because there was a lot more story, in quotations, uh, in this game than there was in the first one, but the story wasn't that great. Honestly, I just wish there was more of this game. I wish it didn't end as soon as it did. Salt and Sanctuary was my first Ska Studios games. I never played any of the Dishwasher games or Charlie Murder, but you had me at 2D Dark Souls. They did a really good job of capturing the precision and skill and even the fear uh, that you, know, you feel when you play a 3D Souls game and tra transitioning that into 2D. Uh, the stakes are still there, you still have to be just as careful and approach every new enemy and new area with as much caution, you know, thinking very carefully about the situation you're in. Uh, but thankfully, enemies can't sneak up behind you. I guess that's one way this game is slightly easier. But you fall a lot more in this game from high heights, like if you're up on a tree or something. Uh, and speaking of trees, this game literally has a skill tree which was probably the most frustrating thing for me, mainly because I saw all of the skills and the abilities that I could have, and I wanted to get them all, but I knew that wasn't feasible. You know, I had to go down a certain path, I had to go down dex or strength, um, and it was kind of similar to the sphere grid in Final Fantasy X, where you could, you know, you could see the ability down the path, and you could maybe make a beeline for it, you know, just get the skills leading up to that, so you could get that extra level in dex, and use that new weapon, or equip that new armor. I felt that this game really captured the, you know, the soul and the essence of Dark Souls 1 in regards to the traversal of the world. While you could fast travel, it wasn't as easy as just sitting at a bonfire. And I found myself wanting to explore the world because I would see a door and I would know that there's some way to get to that door. You know, I could somehow circumvent something and come from the other side and there's probably a cool item or something in there. And I would make mental notes of where things are in the world, and when I got a new ability or, you know, found a key to unlock a door, I would try and backtrack and, and find those secrets. And, you know, the bosses in this game were, they were pretty intense, and none of them really gave me the same difficulty I got from a lot of the Dark Souls bosses I fought. You know, Dark Souls bosses, you know, some of them have left me seething with anger. Uh, and while some of these were challenging, they weren't uh, on that level. Leading up to Watch Dogs 2, my hype was at an all-time meh. The first game was okay, but I had a lot of technical issues, and I didn't really like Aiden as a character. He wasn't that interesting. Fair, pretty boring, actually. The main reason I played that game was for the invasion of other players and Diane Young, of course. The main thing that attracted me to Watch Dogs 2 was the vibe the game gave off. It seemed to be marketed towards a much younger audience, you know, a little more hip, you know, they had their street art and a young cool guy. And it seems like they really took the complaints from the first game, which was very dull and had a brooding main character and really turned it around. The main character in Watch Dogs 2, Marcus Holloway, is one of my favorite characters this year. He's funny, interesting, and he's got some pretty good dance moves too. I didn't like CTOS in the first game, and I still don't like it in this game, but I think the way you interact with it is much more interesting. The first game felt very static, you were just, you know, hopping in between cameras. It felt kind of boring and lifeless. But now that you're using the RC drone and the quadcopter, it feels more exciting, you know, getting into the action with the fear that you might get spotted, but even though your drone is caught, you can still get away just fine. I am so glad that they brought the invasion of other people's games back, and it just boggles my mind how seamless it can be. If there's a player who's in a similar area as you are in their game, you just there's no loading. You just pop into their game and you can hack them within seconds. And having drones and quads completely changes how the hacking metagame works for both the hacker and the person being hacked. 
I've probably spent just as much time invading other people as I have playing the single player. And let me tell you, from what I've learned, bushes are OP. Overall, I really like how they deliver the story in Watch Dogs 2, and I think that comes from the group of hackers, DeadSec. The characters play off each other well and are generally interesting. Honestly, my biggest complaint about this game is that they left out Diane Young. Come on, Ubisoft. Come on. When I first heard about Let It Die, I was pretty interested. Suda51 and Grasshopper. I had recently finished Persona 3 and I had procedurally generated tower climbers on the mind. The fact that its combat was Souls-like and very challenging, and to top it off, it was free to play. Wait. Then I got a little worried. Free-to-play games often come with weird limitations that can be frustrating, but this game doesn't have those. While you can spend cold hard cash on death medals and kill coins and express elevator passes, you don't have to. You can get all of those in the game for free, and the penalty for dying really isn't that high. I was actually kind of glad the beginning of the game forces you to die to reinforce the fact that death in this game isn't the end. Just make a new character and keep going. The constant need to find more blueprints can be maddening, but it's also a really good driving force in the game. It's kind of like Schrodinger's blueprint. Until you turn it into the shop, it's both an amazing weapon and a useless hat at the same time. The bosses in Let It Die are both my favorite and least favorite element of the game. The video intros to the bosses are delightful and really well done. They have a lot of character to them, but the reusing of bosses with slightly different attack patterns and maybe different designs isn't really that exciting. But who knows, maybe the higher you get up in the tower, that will become less prominent. They say the Tower of Barbs is supposed to get over 100 levels high, and I'm only at level like 24. I'm not exactly sure what to expect from the higher levels, but I know there will be some great weapons, some really cool music, and lots and lots of mushrooms. So why aren't you playing this game yet? It's completely free. Just try it out. Alright, we're in the top 5 with Dark Souls 3. Man, 2016 was a pretty good year for Souls-like games, and this one actually is a Souls game. Being the third game in the Dark Souls series, lore has always been a big deal, but it's something I've never really been able to get into. I know it's there and I can appreciate it, and on the odd occasion, I'll notice references to the other games in the series. I've seen YouTube videos of people explaining the details of the lore, but honestly, I think a lot of that can be some bullshit. But for me, the lore isn't why I play these games. I play Souls games because I love the deeply challenging combat and exploring the worlds. The areas in Dark Souls 3 are filled with secrets and can be explored for hours. I do like that there are twisting and turning paths within each area, but I still miss the interconnectivity of the first Dark Souls game where multiple areas would lead back to Firelink Shrine, but I think this game's on the right track. I do love that you'd often see areas off in the distance, and you could basically walk there, given enough time and provided you don't die, but it's nice that you can see an area you'll eventually get to. I thought Dark Souls 3 was a little easier than previous games in the series. Or maybe I've just become a better Souls player and my increased scale kept me alive more? Don't get me wrong, I died plenty of times, but honestly, I could see that number being half as many times in previous Souls games. I did like the dual phase boss battles in this game. Halfway through the fight, the boss changing up their tactics did make things more interesting. Co-op is back, obviously, but I found myself using it a lot less than I did in Bloodborne, and that might just be because I used it a lot in Bloodborne during the challenge dungeons, which aren't in Dark Souls. And I guess I didn't realize how much I enjoyed them until they weren't there anymore. They say this is the last Dark Souls game, or at least in the Cinder storyline, and I'm actually okay with that. I'm always waiting for the next challenging game from Software will throw at us. IO Interactive really dropped the ball with Hitman Absolution. They knew it and they even apologized for it. When they announced Hitman 2016, they said it was going to be more like blood money and I think most of us were pretty skeptical about that. But after playing this new Hitman, I can say they're on the right track. 
The game's still a little too grounded, it kind of takes itself too seriously. There's something magical about this nameless and very serious killer dressed up like a clown to murder a man during its child's birthday party. I don't really feel like Hitman 2016 has anything that's that extreme. Granted, the game does have huge levels, they're giant with dozens and dozens of secrets and rooms and items and contraptions that can be used to dispose of your target, or anyone else I guess you like to take out. I think the issue I had when the first two episodes came out was that I kind of rushed through them just, you know, to get to my target and kill them and then I moved on. I didn't really take the time to explore the levels or replay them. Because when you look deeper, there are lots of hidden gems, conversations that are really well written between NPC characters, and you don't see that when you just rush through. There was a lot of talk about the episodic nature of this new Hitman. It kind of seems like the perfect game for it, but then when you finish a level, there's the urge to play the next level instantly instead of replaying the one you just did. Because that's just how we're used to doing it. But when you take the time to replay the levels, you'll find all of the extra content in the form of, you know, special requirements, you know, wear this outfit, kill this target. You can replay a level with different targets instead of the original one. And the timed elusive targets really up the stakes when you only have one chance to take them out and if you mess it up, then they're gone. Now that they've announced Season 2 of Hitman, I'm really hoping that IO Interactive reaches for the stars and makes some insane scenarios, you know, we've talked about it before, you know, having Hitman on a space station, or Hitman at an amusement park dressing up as the big characters, and boom, 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 and then take out the target. Something just insane, that's what, that's what I want from my next Hitman game, is just insane situations that are fun. The Witness Everyone was freaking out when Jonathan Blow announced his new game, and that's because Braid was so great, and it definitely was. But all we really knew was there was an island with lots and lots of puzzles. And we first saw it, and it was you know, it was a very colorful island, and it made me think of Mist. I thought I was going to be walking around solving you know weird puzzles and complex contraptions. But then I started playing the game, and I was like, wait, these are just lines. Like, what is this? I never imagined how far you could go with lines on grids, like I didn't fathom this. The game has no tutorials, it's just you and the lines. And the way it teaches you the rules of the puzzles, it was it was perfect. You know, it starts very simple, so you you know, you thought you understood what was going on, but you might be wrong, but the more complex the puzzle gets, it you know becomes clear. The Witness has the most aha moments of any game I have ever played. One second you would be looking at a puzzle and you would be completely confused and then, you know, it clicks and all of a sudden everything is clear. I'd played games where I would be stuck on a puzzle before and I'd have to put the controller down and step away, but this is the first game I had to step away from the puzzle in the game to solve it. And that's, you know, your, your brain has to change the way it thinks. The, the world seems random at first, like just this random mishmash island with different environments and stuff, but it's not, like everything kind of is where it is for a reason. The island also seems very small, but it, it's really dense and packed with secret paths and areas that you don't notice at first. Bernadette would sit with me sometimes when I was playing and, and we had so many pieces of graph paper littering my desk, it was, it was almost like a beautiful mind where if I had dry erase markers, I probably would have been writing on my windows and maybe even my walls, I don't know. And then you can talk about the thing that Brad spoiled on YouTube. I, I really wish I could say it, but I don't want to spoil it for the people who haven't played the game. But it's that, that moment I'm so glad I found on my own because your entire view of the world literally changes and my eyes opened to things I had been looking completely through, just looked right past them before, and it was incredible. If there's anything that's stopping you from playing this game, please do whatever you can to get over it and give this game a shot, because you will not regret it. I knew that I would enjoy Stardew Valley, which is kind of why I didn't play it at first, but I didn't know how much I'd actually like it once I did. Within the first 20 minutes, I was completely hooked. I wanted to spend the whole first day just clearing out my land on my overgrown farm, but I knew I needed to start planting some crops to survive. 
And that's when it all set in, the overload of tasks. There was such a limited time in the day to do everything you needed to get done. I spent the first season of the game just fishing with only a few crops to my name. And I'm glad I spent most of the first year not looking at any kind of guides and just going with the flow. Similar to when I was playing The Witness, I would write things up on paper, you know, mock plots of fields to plant seeds, because my farm was going to be efficient. And one of the craziest things about this game is you can play the entire thing never planting a single crop. You can focus on livestock, turning cow and goat milk into cheese, or chicken eggs into mayonnaise to sell. Or you can spend your days mining for minerals or geodes, or you know, setting up some crab traps down by the water or fishing all day. Myself, I tried to be a jack of all trades, and I did a little bit of each. I think one of the driving factors in this game is its saving system. Because you can't save your game unless you go to sleep in your bed, but then when you wake up the next morning and you look outside, you see that, oh, you know, some of my crops are ready to harvest, or I have mail that might have some new information, or a recipe, or I want to check on, you know, my jams and jellies are ready to be sold. And you would tell yourself, you know, just one more day. I'll just, you know, I'll play one more day of the game and then I'll stop. But there's more in Stardew Valley than just farming and resource gathering. There's a whole town of people that have their own stories and their own jobs. And whether you're there or not, they go about their day. But you can talk to them and become friends with them. And you can even get married and have a kid. The pressure of having, wanting to grow the perfect crops for the festival. Or wondering whether your crush is going to like the gift you give them really makes Stardew Valley just a delightful game. And not to mention, the soundtrack just goes so well. Every season has its unique music that just fits the ambiance so well, you know. In, in summer, it's, it's you know, happy and go lucky. In winter, it's kind of sad and dreary. It's hard to imagine that this game was made by just one person. Lots of changes and updates have gone in since I've played. And I know they're all for the better. And I'm probably going to start a new farm to check them out. Uncharted 4's placement on this list was a big debate for me. Why did it make my number one slot? Was it because I'm an Uncharted fanboy? Well, I am, but we can just ignore that for now. I do think that the overarching story from the entire series does have an impact. We've traveled with Drake on his adventures for almost nine years. Now, none of the entries in the series are perfect. They all have issues, this one included. The enemies in this game do not vary that great. They're all similar. And it's lacking the mystical elements that the other entries in the series had. But the set pieces in the story in this final chapter left a pretty big impact on me. I cared more about the relationship and the story of Nathan and Elena and Sully than I ever had. Troy Baker is a great voice actor, and I think his portrayal of Joel in The Last of Us was incredible. But I thought adding him to this last entry in the Uncharted series was kind of a bad idea, and I didn't think it would work that well. And Naughty Dog proved me wrong. Nothing. Sam was a welcomed addition to the crew, a flawed character with a good backstory, and, and that led to us seeing a lot of Nathan Drake's past, which answered a lot of questions we had. Chapter 17, for better or worse, has one of the most impactful conversations in the entire series. The conversation starts in an elevator, and then there's a long silence in the jeep ride that follows. Then, after a life or death situation, we had some character development that my only issue was I wanted more, but it worked really well in the story. I was pretty excited for Uncharted multiplayer, Unfortunately, it did not fill the void in my life, that is, the lack of factions, but it tried its best. The different maps have great layouts. The mystical powers, from the, the slowdown time effect from the Chintamani Stone, to the Wrath of Eldorado's ability to make the enemy team scatter, gave us lots of interesting and close matches. And the rope swinging added a lot of verticality to the combat, and getting a rope melee takedown was super satisfying. While I'd still prefer factions, and I'm excited for factions too, Uncharted 4's multiplayer was a good substitute. I really wish I could spoil the ending of Uncharted 4 in this video, but I won't. 
Uncharted 3 was supposed to be the end of Nate's travels and adventures, and at the time, I was fine with it. But the story we got in Uncharted 4 and its ending left a perfect bow on the Uncharted series, which won't be forgotten anytime soon. Well, that was my top 10 games of 2016. I hope you enjoyed the list. There are so many games that didn't make my list just because I never got around to playing them. Be sure to keep your eyes on 4PlayerNetwork.com and 4PP.TV, where I'll probably be playing more Stardew Valley and The Binding of Isaac. <laughs>